The Academy Award winning actor and starring in Paramount Network's Yellowstone that premieres next Wednesday at 9 Eastern time. Thrilled to have Kevin Costner back here on the show. How are you, sir? I'm good. Really good. And, you know, we were just watching uh, you putt a little bit right there. Uh, everybody was hoping that you'd get down like Roy McAvoy and putt like back in the day. How, how often do you get Roy McAvoy thrown your, your way when you're out and about? Kevin, you mean you mean what, they just somebody just, calling my name? Just people, just when they bring up part of your filmography to you. Well, I tell you what, I can walk around sometimes, and and it's like it's like, hey, crash, you know, it's it, it's Roy, you know, it's like, hey, idiot, and I'm still turning. You know, somebody says, hey, I'll I'll turn. Billy Chapel. It feels like the baseball movies are the ones where the guys will call out to me. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and I and I, it, recently it's been happening. Guys will come up and they're just about to shake my hand. They'll say, "You the one that killed my friend," <laughs> you know, in open range when I hit that guy right in the forehead. Sure. To get it started, and I'm thinking, I have to slow down with everybody. You know, I got to figure out who I am. Yeah, out there. from your filmography of yeah. what people hit you. Yeah, right? and I kind of ha happiest in a way about that, you know, because kind of a common question a lot of times is, you know, what the favorite movie? What's the favorite movie? And yes. And you, it's difficult to answer that, but where I actually find myself is the reality that I'm happiest is that if there's about 12 movies people will mention, mm -hmm. and I don't know what's going to come out of their mouth, and it could be Waterworld, and it could be The Postman. It, it's going to be Field of Dreams. It's going to be Dances. It's going to be JFK. It's going to be those things, but I don't know where it's going to come from, and, and at the end of the day, I think, you know, that's good that it's not one movie that was made four different times. That and, it's, and feels that feels good to me. So, uh, which of the baseball movies do you hear about the most? If you had to split it between Bull Durham and Field of Dreams, yeah, I hear about Bull Durham the, the, always. Amazing, the most. Um, I've, I've I've used a, a phrase already from Bull Durham just in the past two weeks because of the amount of strikeouts there have been in Major League Baseball this year. April was the first month in the history of Major League Baseball where there were more strikeouts than hits, and we're seeing too many guys striking out this year because everybody's swinging for the fences, exit velocity. And the line I keep using is about how strikeouts are not only fascist, they're, they're boring. <laughs> <laughs> so I've used, your, I've used your line quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, know, that, you, know you, do, you do see trends, you know, in, in baseball. And I don't know when the tr trend started. Maybe it was watching Justin Madroya or somebody. I'm not sure. But I... I remember early baseball, just meet the ball, just meet the ball. You know what I mean? You don't just meet the ball. And and you see the way guys swing now. They just come out of their shoes. I mean, you look at Justin swing and you go right through the major league. It's not just meet the ball. It's, it's like, well, it's, exit. it's just swing just as hard as you can. That's what it looks like to me. And that's been like about a 20-year trend in my mind. Exit velocity, all these terms that you hear that are being used. I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that, that. That is just that I keep thinking of like an old baseball man like Crash Davis, what he would think about guys who just want to come up and they think they're going to major the leagues because they've got a quick bat and the ball shoots off the bat. Yeah. And I honestly... Maybe that's why people yeah. keep bringing up Bull Durham. Well, you know, so you, think about, you think about you think about Chris. I mean, we're talking to Ron about this guy that was a real guy. There's you Ron know, Shelton. And, and, yeah, Shelton, and then there was a guy that he actually played with or somebody that or knew about that, like led the the minors in triple in in in, in the minor leagues mm -hmm. and um, led him in the home runs, RBIs, batting average, and he it did it like five years a row in a row, and he couldn't get into the big leagues because he was sitting behind Brooks on the Baltimore organization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a, a long time ago. Those guys just sat back there like insurance, and now players are just brought up, brought up, brought up. But so many players, you know, didn't make it back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and, and I think there was also a – didn't we bring something up to Brockman lately about uh, there was a Crash Davis-type player um, who uh, I think in, in the NBA where he led the, the D-League – in three pointers, like he led <laughs> the history of yeah. the minor leagues in three yeah. pointers, and got his shot with the Lakers at the very end of last season. They were right. chanting his name, MVP, right. MVP. Well, Shelton Just, hit it so right with that thing. It, kind of the, you know, baseball. You know, it, you know, you can't love baseball unless you're into the vulgarity and I, you know, and everything. But there's that poetry too that always is something. And Shelton found it the most when you read it, and 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 maybe most people. That watch Bull Durham. It's a it's a it's a thing that doesn't affect them the way it affected me when I knew when I 
when he was at the end of his career, he decided to go hit that home run in obscurity because it was a record he still wanted. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not one he could ever sit at the bar with guys who were in the big leagues and say, well, I hit the most home. He would never say it out loud. He wasn't that kind of guy. On the other hand, it was a record he knew was, was average, was whatever it was. But there was something in him and his character that he was that close that he went in room with an 18-year-old so that he would hit that last one, did it in obscurity, and then went back to Annie. <laughs> and it was over for him. Mm -hmm. And there was this weird kind of heroic dignity in that thing. Not one, a record he would ever talk about, but one he wanted at that point. Kevin Costner here on The Rich Eisen Show. Uh, have you ever talked about finding out where Bull Durham is today? Where, to find out where Crash Davis is today? No, but never... I know Ronnie I, I know Ronnie is going on the 30-year anniversary to, to Bull Durham on the 15th in, at the stadium. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a real place for him and obviously, I guess, for me. But he's going back um, there and... That movie's really, you know, stood a test of time. Right, and Tin Cup was also with you and, and Ron Shelton. Yeah, as well. I mean, he's, <laughs> I mean, he's the guy that understands that that it, it isn't always about the win. You know, I mean, he he finds the heroism in in just being who you are, the character. I mean, right. it's the greatest twelve in history. That's the that's the <laughs> honor. I love it. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this as well, but the Cleveland Browns have had multiple first-round draft choices twice since draft. I had to figure it out for them. I had them going the right way. <laughs> I did. I, and, you know, twice that's a hard movie to pull rounders. off. I mean, think about that, making a movie about the draft. But I thought we did. You d Damn straight you did. I thought we did. Well, you know, I, I have a small role in that film. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, one of my favorite stories of my entire career was shooting that uh, the day after the first round of the draft in mm. Radio City Music Hall. And I would just, I just come off of like a, a six hour mm. uh, night the night before, and I had another five hour one before. Yeah. And I just figured, okay, I know I have one page of dialogue. I'll just get to it about a half hour before I have to shoot. Yeah. So this is my level of professionalism bringing to acting no. Kevin. So Frank Langella, who played the owner of the Cleveland right. Browns, he shows up on set and says to me, the first thing he says to me is, would you like to run through our lines? And I'm like, oh, no. And I had to just tell him, can you give me a minute? Give me a minute. Yeah, from Broadway actor. <laughs> I know. He said, like, 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 started to shrink. Well, look, you know, when I did, when oh, I did Perfect man. World, um, they asked uh, uh, Vin to, to narrate that, you know, my game, my perfect game. That's right. And he, he came into the studio and... Um, the, the director is, you know, Vince Scully, and, and you know, Mr. Scully, and, and this is kind of our movie here, and, and, he, and he's handed them lines, and he goes, and here's, our, here's some of our lines, if you could say some, this line, this is kind of, he goes, well, could you just show me the film? And he goes, yeah, well, let's let me look at it. He goes, let me see the film I'm going to be, in. so he kind of played like about six minutes of it, and Scully watched it, and he goes, and then you can, you do this, he goes, well, why don't you just let me take a shot at this? And so, and so, he, he heard a few things that the guy said, and then he started saying that stuff that's in the movie. Just off Pushed the top the of his head? Yeah, it's just like, it's like a songbird. And he, and he got, got all the way to it, and, and, he, and a guy, uh, so it was like, I, I looked at that, I was like, uh, here on the, my arm is standing up, and then the director said, oh, and, and he goes, well, well do you want to run it again? And, and, and Vince says, do we need to? And, 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 and do we need to? And and he said, well, maybe maybe something will you know come of it. And Vince said, all right, <laughs> all right, let's do that again. And he looks over at me. And I'm, You're like, I was like, I was like, okay. It was it was his prerogative to do that. Sure. And Vin, who he is, he just goes and Billy, chat, you know, and it's like, and he did something to it. Uh, and so the director t turned out was right on this level. But really, what he, what he did there, you know, and I have it forever, right? You do. I yeah. have it forever. And I got a chance actually to do a speech for him on his last day. Well, you were kind enough to call into the show a, a couple of days after you emceed or you were part and part. I wouldn't so MC. You, no, I, I said, no, no, yeah. I think Al, maybe Al Michaels was, but you spoke at, his, spoke at, at, at his farewell yeah. in Dodger Stadium. Yeah. I, Kevin, I, that's un that's. It was it was it was a it was a big moment. He I got the word. He said, "Look, I'd like to have Sandy, Kirk, and Kevin." And I, 
immediately started running for the exodus. I thought, there's got to be 100 people who need to be on this field. And he goes, no, I want Kevy. And he called me Kevy. And um, I was like, you know, I mean, ballplayers always put a Y on your name. They're the one guys yeah, that can sure. do it. Yeah. And he just did that to me. And he goes, no, I want it because there's something else about him. And so it was just going to be us three. Uh, Kirk couldn't be there. And eventually they evolved. Some politicians spoke. But when I got up, I, I, I found what I wanted to say. I don't know if you got to see it. Yeah, of course. I found, I found what I wanted to say about him. I kind of was thinking about everybody who felt something about him. I felt like I was like talking for them when I was talking about him. Well, you nailed it. And uh, I, I want to take a break. Come back in 60 seconds. We'll talk about Yellowstone. Okay. And, um, and, and so much more with Kevin Costner back in 60 seconds on The Rich Eisen Show. Okay, welcome back. Kevin Costner still hanging with us here. Uh, Yellowstone premiering on Paramount Network next Wednesday at 9 Eastern time. Um, if I had two scripts on the desk, okay, and you are being pitched, as I'm sure you always do, for what your next project is. I have two scripts on the desk. You have no idea if the scripts are any good, but I have two scripts. One of script has you throwing a ball or catching a ball or talking about a ball, and the other one has you riding a horse. Which one do you pick up first? Well, I'm going to make one distinction. Sure. If that baseball one's indoors, I'm going outdoors. <laughs> if it's outdoors now, I have a real tough pick. Okay, so you're, you, okay, you're doing a... Okay, so because draft day was indoors, and I guess... You know what I'm saying? What I'm saying? Dome. I'm a recess guy. I wasn't an academic. I love recess. I love when the bell went off because I, I wasn't ever make letting my mind go. But if I had to choose between a baseball movie and a Western, uh, I would do the Western. Why is that? Because I've got three baseball movies, and I'm never going to have enough Westerns for me. Huh. So when did when did you first fall in love with a Western? Which is a Western? I that think I was I was seven years old. I was I was at the Cinerama Dome. My feet were like right out here. I went to a little boy's base birthday party back in the '60s, and it was how the West was won. And I looked up, and there was an overture playing. It's a four-hour movie, so you can see it marked me in a lot of ways. All my movies are real long too. Mm -hmm. And I sat through that movie. All the kids were dinking around. I sat through the intermission because I didn't want to miss a thing when the intermission was over, watched it all. The first image was Jimmy Stewart in this canoe going across this lake that was like this, it was like your table. There wasn't a ripple. Mm -hmm. And he was dressed in skins and he, and as the camera moved and he saw where he was going, there was these exotic people that he was going to talk to on this beach and they were dressed with the feathers and they were just, it was, and I thought, I was marked at that moment. That was what I wanted to do. I wanted to know who those people were. I wanted that kind of life for myself. And I literally built three canoes in my life up until I was 18. I went down some of the rivers at Lewis and Clark, you know, uh, you know, went, went down. And it was, uh, for whatever reason, uh, that the idea of America, how big it was, what it was, was literally the Garden of Eden, to be honest, uh, before... Uh, there was this giant movement across the continent. And Yellowstone is a more modern day telling. Yellowstone is a different, is a, is a different look. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a like, why didn't I think about it? Look, of course that's what ranching is. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not an, uh, it's not a modern look at ranching. It's a look at modern ranching, which is the trappings are, when I think of, for instance, like, um, Cirque du Soleil, one of the things I think about is like, you know, they reinvented the circus, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it, it, and because and, and, and they have the clowns, the freaks, the juggling, the roots of what the circus are in Cirque du Soleil are, are there. And I think that's the beauty of Cirque du Soleil. They never lost the roots of what the circus is about, but they reinvented it. And, and ranching is still pretty much the same as it's ever been for the last 200 years here. But the differences are what? ATVs and some helicopters if you have a, a giant spread. Condos, and, golf courses. Well, people, that's, that's, that's the threat. I mean, we basically took it from indigenous people. And the interesting thing is the rich people, the, the people that held these big land tracks for the last 150 years, they're losing their land now to just in their death tax, inheritance. These giant ranches are going to, that are beautiful, that in a way keep, the land, you know, 
in a way pristine, not going to be filled with condos and stuff, those are breaking up. The children simply can't afford the taxes. And so if you overlay that, urbanization, lawyers, the environmental protection agencies, our show, and dealing with indigenous people, Native American issues right now, Yellowstone um, it rolls that all together. And it's quite good. I saw it last night. It's really good. And it's next Wednesday is when it debuts at 9 Eastern time on Paramount Network. You play the role of John Dutton, who is the patriarch of the powerful yeah. family and who's uh, controlling that largest contiguous ranch in the U.S. that has all these modern infringements upon it. And yeah, and, I, you know, I've got the dysfunctional family to go with it. You oh, know, it's you don't, you're not going to have any drama without it. But, you know, it's it's. Uh, it works and it's in it in in a way that you know and, it, and it's it, listen there's a it's a it's a i like it you know i've i set my trailer up by a little stream there's a base camp where most all the other trailers are and the food and i said just put my trailer over here by this stream i go i come to work i just start a fire i wait <laughs> i go to work i come back and it's at night if we're working and pretty soon there's six seven people just around the fire talking it's it's a pretty good life well, and uh, and I look forward to seeing Yellowstone here at, at 9 Eastern Time. It's funny, Kevin, when we had our, our first segment, you were talking about all the movies that you get maybe thrown at you. One one film you did not mention, The Untouchables, which is another film. For me, that is a remote drop. Where I see it on TV, I, I just have to drop the remote, no matter where I am in the film. Do you have a, a Sean Connery story you can share? I, I remember one time, um, you know, uh, I, I, w I was with Sean, I was in Chicago, and and as I was kind of talking to him, there's, there's this really this girl was really trying to get my attention. She was cute, and I didn't didn't want to rush over there because Sean told me a story one time of a girl sitting next to him that kept tapping him, tapping him, and he knew she was there. He was he knew he was going to get to her, but he kept up his conversation, kept it up, finally tapping. Finally, when this dumb conversation was over and he really wanted to see what the bird was all about, <laughs> he looked over at her, and her cigarette was just now hanging out of her. Mouth. He was, she was trying to give him what he thought was a note, and it was a lighter, and so she looked pretty <laughs> pathetic. So I had that story on my mind when I was with him, and some girl was trying to get my attention, like looking over, looking over, and finally I'm kind of done with him, and I think, well, I'll stroll over and see what she really wants. So I, I did. I walked, and she was behind the ribbon, and I got really close to her. I said, yeah, and she goes, could you get me Sean's autograph? <laughs> and I went like, I felt like I had a cigarette hanging out of my mouth like this. I said, yeah, of course I could do that. <laughs> the biggest star. The biggest star. Yeah, and, and uh, the real deal and, um, you, know, you know, really honest. I mean, he, w w he was upset on Untouchables. He was upset because he thought somebody had treated him wrong in production. It was going to cost him money, and money was important to him, how it worked and that kind of thing. And he, he, was really, he was really angry. He was in a bar, and he called me over, and he goes, Mr. Nash. He'd call me Ness. <laughs> He goes, Mr. Off, off hey, Mr. Nash. Yeah, and, and I go, yeah. And and I go, what? He goes, she's going to sit down here with me. And I, and I sat down, and he had this piece of paper, like a yellow pad, mm -hmm. just like what you have. Yeah. And, he, and he said, do you remember this? Do you remember that? And it was like stuff that was right and stuff that was wrong. And, 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 I, and I said, I remember that. I remember that. And, yeah, I remember that. And he goes, God, thank you. And he went and tore this guy's head off. He just needed to be sure. He needed to be sure that that he wasn't going to be wrong. All facts confirmed by yeah, Kevin Costner. Yeah, he didn't want to kind of, you know, oh. but boy, then, it, you know, then then it was lit. Then it was on. Look out. Yeah, and I, I, mean, and I admired him for that. And, you know, Burt Lancaster as well. I mean, from yeah. Field of Dreams. My yeah. Word. And, you know, Burt, Burt when, when he was doing that scene that was so beautiful, behind the desk, you wrap your arms around second base, you look up at that sky. He was a lot with his hands. Mm -hmm. He was a lot with his hands. And, um, you know, and he, and, 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 you know, and he told me, oh, the studios were scared of me. They're scared of me. <laughs> and, I, and he goes, me and Douglas, they're scared of me. Kirk Douglas. Yeah, and I asked him this, I asked him the scene about the Kentucky and, you know, where he runs across the w water, if you ever saw that. And, and he goes, you saw that? I go, yeah. And he goes, you saw it? I said, yeah. And he goes, you know how I did? I said, well, no. I, I, and he goes, I'll tell you what I did. <laughs> he said, I started where I had to end. And I ran back as quick as I could. <laughs> and he said, and I wanted to see. And I said, 
when I start running back, load the gun. I need to know how long it's going to take you. And so he said, I did, and that was the mark. And that's where I had him put the camera. <laughs> so now then they call action. I'm running this way. And just about the time he got the gun loaded, I jumped and I had him down. It was perfect. <laughs> and and I, just, I just listened to him. And he just looked at me and goes, they were scared of me. <laughs> They were all scared of me. Fantastic. It was, it was a, he was a good thing. And he, he was also generous to people. You know, like I, I said to him, you know, and, and I said, you know, that, that fight you had with Mathau. And he goes, you saw that? And I go, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> he goes, yeah. Because he was, yeah. Right. But that's a really good thing. And, you know, we think of Mathau as that great comic, that kind of hound dog, you know, sure, beat down look. Bad news bears, but he was a so. bad he was a badass in the Kentucky and, and I, and he says, I talked to him about how the whip went out and it was the whip. He was losing the fight and the girl rolls like wagon over the wheel. And he, and he's just, he's been beating Lancaster up, beating him up. And now he throws his whip and it's a kind of a coup de grace. And the girl who like Lancaster is on a wagon. She sees it. She clucks the horse and it moves over the thing and math out for the last and goes, mm -hmm. and then the music starts and Lancaster gets to win the fight. And that's kind of why I like the movies. You saw that? And like I saw <laughs> that. Well, I mean, he directed the the film as well. Yeah. Um, this has been, uh, as always, great uh, chatting with you. My last one for you is: What is your remote drop movie? I don't know how much TV My you watch. That? Your remote drop movie, where you're watching TV if you do have the time, and you pass a movie. What is Kevin Costner's? Yeah, I watch the Cool Hand Luke. That's it. No matter where you pick I'll it up, I watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll watch it. It was it's uh What what about Cool Hand Luke makes that your remote drop movie? I don't know. It was a perfect movie for him. It was a perfect movie for anybody watching. I I you know, I you know, the the Crash Davis doesn't always win either just Tin Cup and neither did Cool Hand Luke. And you somehow in your heart, even though you want good endings, people want happy endings. Sometimes what we realize if if we can't get the happy ending the ending we have to get is the one that we have to understand why it ended the way it did and when we really understand something the way it's supposed to be we have a easier way of accepting it and go that's the way it had to be and the and and and, and that's the poetry and those that are always trying to make we like a good ending i like it just as much as anybody else but sometimes when I feel the power of a movie and it doesn't end the way I want, if if the level of understanding has been built into it, I accept it and it and it becomes uh, something I love. Check out uh, Paramount Network's Yellowstone starring uh, you, Kevin Costner, Wednesday, uh, June 20th, for those without the calendar, uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time. You are welcome here anytime you you Thanks. Wish. Thanks for having me. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for coming here. That's Kevin Costner here on The Rich Eisen Show. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.